Welcome to our IAI Colloquia of the Semester. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not regular members, or I hope you, you would be after this seminar, these seminars are on uh, first Wednesday of each month. And these are exciting seminars by our own faculty. And today, I'm honored to introduce my good friend and colleague, Professor Richard Law. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just want to say just a couple of things about Richard, because that's what we do before the seminars. Um, actually, Richard graduated from University of Maryland uh, in 1994. And then he moved to UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and he received his master's and PhD. And mm -hmm. in uh, 2004, that's when you returned, right? 2001. 2001, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 2001 is mistaken. Yeah. 2001, he returned, and he's been a member, uh, faculty member in the Institute for Systems Research, as well as, of course, electrical and computer engineering department. Richard's research. Uh, addresses many areas of uh, control, very exciting area of research, and today he's going to tell us about some of his research mm -hmm. uh, activities that uh, he's been doing recently. Right. Richard. Right. Thank you, Roger. Um, so this talk, maybe uh, the title of the talk may be somewhat misleading, but uh, let me just start with a comment that this is based on joint work with the CDOS uh, Pell, who's just sitting here. So every correct statement that I make, he should get the credit. All the wrong stuff that I, I say, you can blame me for that. Um, so here's the overview of the talks. I'm going to start with a uh, fairly short overview of game theory for those who are not familiar with the game theory. And then I'll briefly go over a few examples where people try to, when I say people, I really mean myself, uh, um, where we try to use a game theoretic framework to solve some engineering problems. And then I'll move on to the main part of this talk, which is the learning in games. And then I'll present some recent results that we have using two uh, algorithms as examples. Then I'll finish off with a few comments on the future directions that we are pursuing. So game theory, uh, first of all, game theory is not about video games, so it will certainly will not make you a better game player. In fact, I, in graduate school, I went to this uh, game theory course in math department just to realize it was literally about games, not the game theory that I had in mind. Um, so game theory that I'll be talking about is actually a study of rational decision making or in strategic interactions among multiple decision makers that are assumed to be rational. And these decision makers are called the players. And game theory is often used to again study these interactions in situations of conflict or cooperation. So what I mean by decision is actually a choice one of these agents makes based on the information that's available to the agent. And based on the type of information available to the agents, you can have different types of games. And the consequences of the choices these agents make are captured uh, by what we call payoffs or the utilities. And the implicit assumption in game theory is that there is some form of interdependency in payoffs or the utilities among the agents. Otherwise, you simply have a straight up optimization problem. So game is nothing more than a mathematical model that approximates the reality that we are interested in studying. And there are many different types of games, and I'll present a few different types. And then the choice of a suitable game that you want to use will depend on many factors, so there is no kind of a um, correct answer to that question. And as a mathematical model or approximation, it leaves out many of the details of a complicated reality, and that also has uh, some implications, which in part motivates the uh, study um, that I'm going to talk about today. So roughly speaking, there are two types of games that people often think about. One is a non-cooperative game and the other one is a cooperative game. Non-cooperative game is often used to study a situation where it's difficult to actually have an agreement or binding contract among the agents to enforce the cooperative behavior among the agents. So because of this difficulty, we often assume that players or agents make decisions independently of each other to optimize their own payoff functions. Whereas in cooperative game, um, it's possible to actually induce or encourage a cooperative behavior among the groups of uh, players called the coalitions. So now the players can actually cooperate with each other to uh, form different coalitions. And this cooperation is ensured through some sort of binding agreement or contract, sometimes involving an independent third party. Um, and this agreement can be reached through bargaining or some sort of a negotiation, which can be actually modeled using tools in cooperative game theory. 
So unlike in the non-cooperative game where the competition is among individual players, in cooperative game the competition is among the coalitions of players. Now for this talk we're going to focus on the first game, which is a non-cooperative game. So game can be described in many different ways, and I'm going to go over a few different ways. The first is called the normal or strategic form game, which consists of three things. One, you need to know the set of players or decision makers. Secondly, you need to know the set of choices or actions available to each agent. So I'm going to denote the set of strategies or actions available to agent I by script AI. And third, you need to know the payoff function. So given once every agent chooses the action, the payoff function tells us exactly which agent is receiving what. So that's given by the payoff function. Um, for, first example that I'm going to use is something that we, must, we all play when we were little. So it's a two-player game of rock, paper, and scissors. So here there are two players, and then each player has the same action space given by a sub i here, which consists of three choices, rock, paper, and scissors. And once two players choose their actions, based on the actions, they will receive some payoff given by this payoff matrix. So here I'm assuming that if you win the game, you win a dollar. If you lose the game, and you lose a dollar. In the case of a draw, uh, they receive nothing. So that's one example of a normal form game. The second example is a well-known game in game theory called the Prisoner's Dilemma. So the situation is the following. Suppose there are two teenagers that committed some petty crime. The police basically have them in custody, but their evidence is somewhat sketchy, so they like to actually get confession out of these teenagers. So they put these teenagers two different interrogation rooms. Right? So if these teenagers cooperate with each other and do not tell the police anything, then they'll just get, spend the night in the jail and then they'll go home. If one of them defects and then makes an incriminating statement against his friend, then he'll go home the same day without paying any penalty. His friend, on the other hand, will spend three days in jail. Right? If both of them defect and then make an incriminating statement against each other, then they will both spend two nights in jail. So that's what this game is, again, describing roughly. So this will be another example of a normal for a game. And there is a second type of game um, that I'm going to briefly talk about. So the first two games are examples of what's called the simultaneous games. In other words, they choose their action without knowing what the other person is going to do. So this is an example of what's called a static game. And the second type of game is called the extensive form game, which actually is an example of a sequential game, which is an example of dynamic game. So the extensive form game, unlike in the simultaneous game, allows us to kind of model the order or sequence in which the decision makers are going to make decisions or choose their action. So this sequence is given by what's called the game tree, which is described here, for instance. And, this, and for each decision point here, given by the circles, there is a decision maker associated with that decision point. So at the beginning of the game, John will either make an offer with a contract A to Pam or a contract B or it does not make any offer to Pam, in which case the game will end. If John makes an offer with a contract A, Pam has a choice between accepting the contract or rejecting the contract. So if Pam accepts the contract, then in that case, the John will receive a payoff of seven and then Pam will receive a payoff of eight. So it describes the sequence of decision points that will be reached depending on the choices the decision makers make. Um, a game can be um, either complete information or incomplete information game. A game is said to be a complete information game if the structure of the game is known to all the players. In other words, every player knows everything there is to know about the game, including the set of players, set of actions available to every player, as well as the payoff function for everybody. So that's a lot to ask, but if this is the case, then you have a complete information game. If the structure of the game is not known to at least one player, then the game is said to be incomplete information game. Right. So an example of a complete information game would be this tic-tac-toe game or the chess, so where the rules are known to both players. Right. Whereas an example of an incomplete information game will be sealed bid auction because one, if you participate in a sealed bid auction, you may not even know who's participating. And even when you know who's participating, you don't know the value of the participants, so you don't know the payoff function of these participants. And for that reason, the game is an incomplete information game. A game can be either perfect information or imperfect information. Um, 
So game is said to be a perfect information game if in the extensive form game, all the prior moves are known to the decision player, uh, decision maker. So they know exactly where they are in the game. Right? And they have all the information about the, the moves made by all the prior players. If there's a player that's not sure of exactly where the game is at any point, then the game is said to be imperfect information game. So let me illustrate what I mean by that using this example. So this is the same example that we had earlier, which is an extensive form game. So here, I'm assuming that if John makes an offer with a contract A, Pam knows it, so she knows that she has a contract A available. If John offers contract B, then Pam also knows that contract B is being offered. Right? And then based on that information, the Pam can make an informed decision. On the other hand, suppose a scenario where John writes down the contract on a piece of paper and puts it in a sealed envelope and gives it to Pam without telling her exactly which contract is offering. So in that case, Pam may not know exactly which contract is being offered. So these two decision points will be indistinguishable to Pam. So Pam may not know exactly which contract that she has available in the envelope. So if that is the case, then this game is said to be an imperfect information game because Pam is not sure exactly which decision point she's at. All right? And these two decision points that Pam cannot distinguish are called information set in the game theory. Um, let me just go over the rest of the terminologies. So a strategy for an agent is nothing more than a probability distribution over the set of available actions to the, to the agent. So for agent I, again, script AI is the set of available actions for player I or agent I. And let me denote by delta over AI the probability simplex over this set. And then strategy is nothing more than this element in the simpl uh, sim uh, probability simplex, which is simply assigns different probabilities to different available actions. Right? And we say that this strategy is a pure strategy if the probability distribution assigns either 0 or 1 to every action. So it means that the agent is going to choose one action with the probability 1 and the others with the probability 0. Otherwise, if the probability distribution assigns positive probability to more than one action, it's called a mixed strategy. Right? Um, I'm almost done with this part. So solution concept, this is to, uh, going to be the kind of a focus of the talk. So solution concept is just something that people throw around quite often. And solution concept simply refers to the rule that we use to predict the outcome of a game. So given a game, this solution concept will tell you which outcome is more likely to emerge in practice than others. So that's what the solution concept is. And a popular solution concept is called the Nash Equilibria, named after John Nash. So strategy profile, again, straight profile simply has a strategy for each player. Then this strategy profile is said to be a Nash Equilibrium if Given the strategy of other agents, no agent can increase its own payoff or expected payoff by selecting a different strategy. So no player can increase its own payoff through unilateral deviation from the strategy profile. The underlying assumption again is that players are going to make independent decisions even when they use mixed distribution. And if the strategy profile happens to consist of pure strategies, then it's called the pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Otherwise, it's called a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Now, one thing about pure strategy Nash equilibrium is that, first of all, it's not guaranteed to exist. And when it exists, it's not guaranteed to be unique. So there could be lots of Nash equilibria when one pure strategy Nash equilibrium uh, exists. Let me briefly just mention another equilibrium concept, uh, which people started paying attention to, called the correlated equilibria. Now, correlated equilibria is a solution concept proposed by Robert Ullman in 1974. The difference between correlated equilibria and Nash equilibrium is that in Nash equilibrium, even when you're using mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, each player is making independent choice without knowing how other agents are actually choosing the actions according to the mixed strategies. In the correlated equilibria, however, you are the actual mix, the distribution that you are going to use or the choice of action you're going to select depends on what other players are doing. So there is a correlation in the selection of the actions across different players. So for that reason, it's called the correlated equilibria. So this concept goes just slightly against the, uh, the general principle of a non-cooperative game. But what you can show is, if you look at the set of a Nash equilibria, including pure strategy Nash equilibria and um, mixed strategy Nash equilibria, this set of a Nash equilibria already is a subset of the set of a correlated equilibria. So correlated equilibria kind of extends the set of equilibrium points that you can select. 
Now, it turns out Nash equilibrium, although it's a fairly natural solution concept if you think about it, it actually had several major shortcomings people tried to address over the years through what we call re refinements of Nash equilibrium. So let me just briefly mention two of them. Um, one is called the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So going back to this example that we had earlier, in this example, you can show that there are three pure strategy Nash equilibria. The one is John chooses contract B at the beginning, and Pam plays except at both decision points. Right? The second equilibrium is John offers contract A, and Pam plays except at this decision point and reject at the second decision point. And third, the Nash equilibrium is John offers no contract, and Pam plays reject and reject. But if you think about this equilibria, two of them, especially the last two of them, involve what we call irrational choices by PAM. So this is what I mean. So suppose you look at the second equilibrium. Now this requires PAM to actually reject contract B here. If he, so for that reason, John will actually offer contract A because he play, uh, offers contract B, then PAM is going to reject it, right? However, if John, for some reason, if he offers contract B, then it's in Pam's own interest to actually accept that contract rather than reject it. Because by accepting the contract, she will receive a pay of five, but rejecting it, she'll get nothing. So she's actually making an irrational choice at this decision point. Similarly, the third equilibrium requires Pam to play reject at both decision points. Again, this requires irrational choices at both of these decision points. So, in this case, there is only one subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium, which satisfies one additional uh, condition that if you look at subgame or subtree of the entire game tree, starting from a root of the subtree, it has to actually form Nash equilibrium for that subgame or the subtree of the game. So, in this case, if you look at this, this subgame here, starting with this distant point, then PAM should always accept that contract. For the reason, these two Nash equilibria will not be subgame perfect Nash equilibria. Right. And there is a further ref refinement of Nash equilibrium. So let me first mention that subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium, and trembling hand perfect equilibrium is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So it's a further refinement of the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So let me, let me explain what it means. So suppose you have this game. These players, Elaine and George, have two actions, left or right. And you can show that there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria. One is left, left, and the other one is right, right. Right? Now, however, if you look at the second Nash equilibrium that requires both players to play right and right, this is, the un in some sense, unstable. So what that means is, if Elaine knows that George is going to play right with the probably one, then Elaine will be happy playing right. Because um, she cannot increase her payoff by playing left. However, if George, George is not very reliable, and there's a positive probability, no matter how small that probability is, if George plays left, then Elaine should always switch to left instead of playing right. So in that sense, if there is any positive probability, one of them will deviate for whatever reason, they're going to actually switch to the first Nash equilibrium. Right? So, this traveling and perfect equilibrium are designed to actually eliminate or get rid of these equilibria that are in some sense not very robust against the perturbations in the system. All right. So moving, so now that we define most of the things I need, let me go through some of the examples in engineering. These are the three areas that I have worked on in the past. The first one is a spectrum trading or dynamic spectrum access. The second one is independent security games. And the third one is a traffic assignment or routing. So tra spectrum trading problem actually arises because now FCC is actually changing the rule a little bit. So in the old days, FCC simply auctioned away spectrum for billions of dollars to private entities. And then once private entity purchases the spectrum for billions of dollars, it has exclusive use right and nobody else can use it without explicit permission and that was rarely given. Now what they realized based on the measurements, because the demand for the spectrum is increasing and they're running out of the free spectrum, they started measuring the utilization of different parts of the spectrum and found out much of the spectrum is actually underutilized both in space and time. So what they tried to do is actually allow 
secondary users to actually use license spectrum that was already sold to somebody. And these are called the secondary users. So a particular example is AT&T, Verizon, and these companies that have their own spectrum for which they paid money. And there are these service providers called the mobile virtual network operators, such as Virgin Mobile, that do not have their infrastructure or their own spectrum. And they need to actually lease the spectrum from these primary users that own their own spectrum. So the question is, if you have these primary service providers, they may be willing to at least are part of underutilized spectrum. And if there are many of these primary users, and also there are many sub secondary users that are interested in leasing the spectrum, then how do you actually design the trading market with a certain desirable properties? So that's something that you can actually study using game theory. Uh, in particular, this problem actually requires a non-cooperative game and cooperative game as well as a mechanism design that pretty much covers a large portion of the game, game theory. And the second example is so-called inter interdependent security game. So if you look at the security of the organizations or, or agents, in many cases, the security of one agent or organization depends on the security investments of others. Yes? Yes? So in the previous slide, leasing is something that would have been an option anyway, even in an era when reasonably well utilized, right? Yes. And so the big providers could lease out some stuff. So why is it a, an option of a greater importance to consider now? So what they're trying to do is, rather than allowing the primary users to have a private agreement, they want to actually form a market. It's called the secondary spectrum market and design the market mechanism. So that's where the... So the leasing costs would not be somehow determined by just one primary uh, uh, owner. Instead, there will be a competition between different Exactly. Exactly. Right. So in the second example, so let me just start with an example. Suppose I'm trying to decide whether to get vaccinated for flu or not. So suppose I'm a kind of lazy person, which is true. So I'm trying to decide whether it's really worth the effort and time to go to the doctor's office and get the flu shot. Now suppose I actually watch all the people that I come in contact with, including my own family. And suppose everybody is already vaccinated. And I suppose the flu vaccine is perfect so that once you get vaccinated, you never get the flu. In that case, since I have, I'm in no danger of getting the flu, I may not actually get vaccinated. Right? On the other hand, if half the people that I come in contact with are not vaccinated, then I may be uh, at the risk of getting the flu from one of these people. So in that case, I may actually go to the doctor's office and get vaccinated. So the decision that I'm going to make will depend on what other people around me are doing. So that's what I mean by the, uh, the, the security decisions depending, uh, being dependent on what other people are doing. So this dependence in the security introduces what's called the network effect or network externalities. And this presence of network ex externalities or effects complicates the uh, study of the interdependent security, especially in large system. So what we try to do is uh, try to understand how this presence of network externalities and the structure of the underlying graph that governs the interdependence affects the choices of the agents and their final security. So that's something that, again, you can um, study. For instance, in this example, I used what's called the population game models with the help of the um, Cheng Lu model in the random graph uh, literature. And the last one is a somewhat obvious one, traffic assignment or routing that dates back to 1970s. And Rosenthal in his paper looked at what's called the congestion game, which is related to the traffic assignment problem. And then people also, in uh, a couple of dec decades ago, looked at the internet routing problem using game theory. And one thing that actually people uh, pay close attention to is what's called the brass paradox. Um, well, the brass paradox actually refers to this quite interesting observation. Suppose you start with this kind of network. So there, is a, there are two paths between these two points, right? And suppose you actually notice higher congestion on one path compared to the other. So you try to alleviate the congestion by creating another road from top to bottom, right? But in some cases, adding this extra road to connect the top path to the bottom path actually leads to worse congestion for everybody. So that's what's, some, what's often referred to uh, as a brass paradox, which basically indicates that when you're trying to actually dimension the network, then you have to be a little bit careful in the way you actually dimension the network. 
So moving on to the, you know, the part that I wanted to talk about, learning in games. So the scenario that we are interested in is the following. So we have an incomplete information game played by a set of players, except that agents are not aware of the structure. In fact, they may not even be aware of other agents that are playing the game, or in fact, they may not be aware that they're playing the game altogether. Right? So in this example, suppose these four agents are playing against the, each other, except that they are not aware of it, and they don't know what other people are doing. Right? However, in some cases, these players may interact with each other many times. All right. So some of the examples include, again, dynamic channels, accessing cognitive radio. They're constantly trying to learn what's going on in the network, wireless sensor network, and so on and so forth. So if these players are interacting with each other many times, over, then they may be able to actually learn from the pay, uh, past payoffs, as well as the actions, if they are observable, the actions taken by other players. So that's the kind of setup that we are interested in. So we model the interaction among the agents over time uh, using what's called the infinitely repeated game. So what that means is you have this uh, incomplete information game, and that, sta that incomplete information game called the stage game is repeated at every t equal to 1, 2, 3, and so, so on and so forth. And we denote the action profile, the actions chosen by all the players by this bold face A of t. And then agents they can update their strategies through learning. So they are watching what's going on. And then based on that information, they can update their strategies. And since I'm assuming that we are dealing with the incomplete information game where the structure of the game is not necessarily known to all the players, I'm going to focus on what's called uncoupled dynamics. So uncoupled dynamics simply means that the updates of an agent's action or strategies do not depend on the payoff functions of others. So you may not necessarily know the payoff function of others. And for the reason, I'm assuming that you, whatever learning you do, you cannot make use of the payoff function of other players. In fact, you cannot even make uh, use of the actions selected by other players. All right? So yeah? Yeah? you see, if you have a mixed game, yes. and each player's strategy depends on the actions of the others, there's a conditional probability distribution. No, that would be the correlated equilibrium. So, yes. yeah. Okay, so, but, but then, uh, the, there is no underlying joint distribution. No. How do you, how do you evaluate the value of the game? So the value of the, so you, I'm assuming in fact that the, the, if you look at the joint distribution, it's given by a product. So that's what I meant by the, the agents making independent decisions. Yeah. So the conditional distribution of the actions taken by other agents does not depend on the, uh, the choice of my own action. That case is no problem. Right. But if it does... So in our case, because we don't know what's going on in the game, I don't even know who's playing the game against me. So we are, we are, I'm assuming that each individual agent will make a choice without knowing additional information about what they're doing. All right. So I'm going to make it slightly more precise what I mean by that. All right. Any other questions? Now, it turns out um, there is this impossibility result by Hart and Maskell that appeared in the American Economy Review paper in 2003, which says the following. If you are trying to actually design uncoupled dynamics or learning rule that would ensure that the, all the agents will converge to Nash equilibrium, you are out of luck because there are games for which you simply cannot design or compose the dynamics that will ensure the convergence to Nash equilibrium. So in light of this impossibility results, what people try to do is, again, figure out conditions under which you can actually ensure convergence to the right equilibrium in the right sense, in an appropriate sense. So that's the question that we want to kind of look at. So under what condition or what type of games can you actually design a learning rule so the agents will converge to Nash equilibrium, for instance? Yes? Maybe I've missed this, but yeah. what, in what sense, one talks about dynamics here, and in what sense dynamics is uncoupled or coupled? Um, so if you wait a few more minutes, I'll be able to answer that okay. question. Uh, right. So, uh, so let me just mention this, that we are going to consider only finite games, meaning that there are finitely many players, and for each agent, there are finitely many available actions. So that's what we mean by finite games. So because of the impossibility results, people try to actually look at games with a certain structures and see if they can actually ensure convergence. So first class of games is a somewhat uninteresting class of games called the identical interest game, where the payoff function of everybody is the same. 
So everybody pay a function u i is equal to some function phi. In that case, you can easily show there exists a pure strategy in equilibrium, which is a maximizer of the common utility function. Second class of game is a generalization of identical interest game called the potential games, again, uh, studied by Rosenthal in, in 1973. And what he in fact is shown is that every congestion game that arises in a traffic assignment is a potential game. So in a potential game, there is what's called the potential function, which I denote by psi, such that if you assume all the agents, except for agent I, fix their actions, and you look at the difference in the payoff for agent I when it switches between two actions, then this difference in the payoff is always equal to the difference in the potential function. All right? All right? So you can again show that there exists at least one pure stretch in Nash equilibrium, which is the maximizer of the potential function. So this is not much of a, a generalization in that sense. And then further generalization of the potential games is called the weakly acyclic game. So a weakly acyclic game does not have a potential function necessarily, but it has what's called a global objective function, which I'm going to call omega, such that if you take any action profile which is not a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, then you can find some agent i star and some action for this agent, which I denote by a star dagger, such that if this a agent i star switches its action to a i star uh, dagger, then it can increase its own payoff. And when that happens, this global objective function value also increases. So what that means is, you may not necessarily have a potential function, for, but for any non-pure strategy Nash nice equilibrium action profile, at least the one agent's local payoff function is aligned with this global objective function. So for that reason, you can do a lot of things. Um, an alternate definition of weekly acyclic game is what's slightly more convenient for us. And the alternate definition says the following. Suppose you choose an action profile which is not necessarily pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Then what you can do is actually find what's called the better reply path starting with that action profile. So you can get to a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And along the way, you allow exactly one agent that has an incentive to deviate to change its action so it can increase its own payoff. So the key point is that you allow only one agent at a time, going from one action profile to next, All right? So the relationship among different games, again, is that among all the finite games in the middle, you have an identical interest game, and the potential games include the identical interest game as a special case, and the weekly acyclic games include the potential games as a special cases. Now, just say a few words about different learning rules people have studied in the past. So I'm going to actually just briefly mention these three um, well-known ones. The fictitious play is the kind of a most well-known and the oldest learning rule, which requires that each agent has some belief about what other agents are doing and selects an action that's optimal with respect to that belief. And the regret matching and regret testing both use what's called the regret. And regret is an agent simply can compute how much better the agent would have been able to do using an action it did not play in the past. So it has some regret if there was another action that could have gotten the pay, uh, agent a higher payoff. Right? And there are many other learning rules that I will not go over. There are learning rules that are designed to find the efficient pure stretch and equilibrium, socially efficient action profile, and there is something called the perfect foresight equilibrium, and there are many, many different uh, equilibrium as well as the uh, learning rules. So let me come to the algorithm that I wanted to discuss. So I'm going to go over two algorithms briefly. So the first one is called the generalized better reply pass algorithm. And hopefully it will be clear why it's called that. So the setup uh, to answer the question is, so at time t equal to 1, they randomly select their actions according to some domain distribution. Right? And starting at time t equal to 2, they are going to start uh, updating their actions or strategies based on the information that was available up until that point. So in order to do this, I'm going to assume that the following information is available to the agent. So given any action profile, I'm assuming that every agent can determine what we call strictly better reply. So what this means is, you, the agent I assumes that other agents will fix their actions at A minus I, which comes from this action profile. And agent I goes through all its actions and computes the payoff they will get. 
and choose the ones that would give the agent higher payoff than action AI that is specified in the action profile. So this is a set of strictly better replies. And the generalized better reply pass algorithm works as follows. So at time t, you look at, again, uh, the payoff that you've gotten at time t minus 1. And based on that, you find the set of a better, strictly better reply. So the actions that you should have used to get higher payoff than the one they used before. All right? Now, in some cases, you may not be able to do this reliably, and I'll come back to this uh, case in a second. For the time being, assume that the AI agents can find this set of a strictly better replies. So if there is no strictly better reply, then it's doing as well as it could. So in that case, the agent simply plays the action that it played in the previous period. Now, if this set of strictly better replies is not empty, then it chooses each of the strictly better replies with some positive probability. And this probably could depend on the difference in the payoff. But at the same time, we assume that there is a positive probability that the agent will stay with the same action that it played in the previous period. Right? So it's the, it, it sees a strictly better reply, but it's not quite sure. So you may want to actually play that action one more time. And what we can show is that this algorithm actually guarantees convergence to pure strategy national equilibrium for a class of games that are larger than the set of uh, uh, games that include all the weekly asically games. So this class of game we call generalized weekly asically games. So this uh, game is a generalized weekly asically game. If you can find what we call generalized better reply path, so this generalized better reply pass is very similar to the better reply pass that we discussed when we discussed the weekly asically game, except that rather than allowing only one agent to update its action at a time, we can allow multiple agents to update their actions at a time, because multiple agents may have an incentive to deviate at the same time. So that's the only difference from the weekly asically game. Then what you can show is the following. So the first assumption simply says the following. Even when an agent sees a strictly better reply, in other words, there is an action that would give the agent a strictly higher payoff, it would still play the same payoff, uh, same action that it did in the previous uh, period with a positive probability. So there is just kind of this inertia that carries the agent. So if under that assumption, you can show that if the game is a generalized weekly acyclic, then starting with any initial action profile, you will converge to a pure strategy in equilibrium with a probability one. So in other words, there exists some finite T star and a pure strategy in equilibrium A star, such that action profile will get to that pure strategy in equilibrium and then stay there forever. Yes? So the, the, the limit is a yeah. pure strategy. Yes. So in the uh, algorithm itself, yeah. probabilities were chosen. Mm -hmm. They can be any probabilities, or have they got to be chosen in a particular way? Uh, which probability are you referring to? I'm sorry. The, action, the actions. So the. Um, so the. Um, which epsilon? I'm sorry. The beta function. Uh, oh, this. So I'm. Um, so yeah. So these epsilon. So the underline and the overline. I'm assuming they are just the positive and less than one. So. The only thing that I want to ensure is that every strictly better reply is played with a positive probability. And there is also positive probability to stay with the same action. So that's the only requirement. Other than that, anything? Yes? So the beta functions, beta i, they can be arbitrary as I guess they're. It can be arbitrary distribution. Yes. So in your unstable yeah. game, yeah. With, you know, the 5, 5, or 10, 10. Right. What happens there? In this case, do you miss the 10, 10 payoff because you never, because that, that gives the fact that the probability is never 0 or 1. Uh, you're talking about the game that um, has a... Yeah, yeah. Right. So, it's possible that you may actually converge to Nash equilibrium that's not traveling and perfect equilibrium. Um, so, but if you actually assume that there is any kind of perturbation in the game, that equilibrium will not be stochastically stable in the sense that you may get there, but you'll quickly get out of it. Um, but at least in this scheme, yes. you would perhaps. You might, yes. So you might actually converge to the equilibrium in the absence of any perturbation. Um, so that's the first convergence, the basic convergence result. The second one simply says, 
Not only it converges, but if you look at the probability that you are not a pure strategy in equilibrium, that probability decays geometrically fast. So that implies that the expected convergence time is finite, all right? And this parameter eta that determines the geometric decay depends on the underlying game structures. In particular, if you look at the generalized better reply, if you look at the shortest path to pure strategy in equilibrium from any, every action profile that's not equilibrium, and choose the one that has the largest, the shortest path to pure strategy in equilibrium, and then length of that shortest path governs this parameter eta. Um, in addition, you, what you can show is that if the game is not generalized weakly acyclically, then you can show that there is just at least one initial action profile. So if you start from that action profile, then there is no hope of ever converging to a pure strategy in equilibrium. So in that sense, the algorithm guarantees converge to pure strategy in equilibrium, starting from any initial action profile, if and only if the game is generalized weakly acyclically. So that's the basic algorithm, yes, Andre? And the dumb, dumb question. Yeah. Uh, so so you, from, from, from the result that you're talking about, yeah. it seems that reaching a Nash equilibrium is a good thing. Ah, oh, so yes. So, yeah, so. Maybe several of them, some of them much better than others. Right. In between. Right. So, one part of. Um, the application of game theory to engineering problem that I didn't talk about today is what's called the utility design. So when you are trying to apply game theory framework to engineering problem, there is a first step which is called the utility design where actually you assign the payoff function to different agents in such a way the Nash equilibrium will have a certain desirable property. So you design the game in such a way the Nash equilibrium is the desired operating point at equilibrium and you let this guy somehow converge to that desired operating point. So when you do that because you have theory that allows you to converge to Nash equilibrium? Right. So there are two parts. You want to design the utility and the second part is to design the algorithm so that they can get there. Right. Yeah. Um, the second part that I want to briefly mention is the first the algorithm requires, I uh, said at least the first part assumes that the moment they make a choice, the, the payoff information will be available right away so they can update their action. In general, that's not quite true when you're dealing with engineering problems and there could be all kinds of delays in the system. So the question is, again, in the presence of delays, can you still ensure convergence to the Nash equilibrium? So this is something I noticed that people haven't really paid attention to in the game theory literature. And what you can show is, again, I'm going to skip some details. If you model the four delays and the feedback delays using stochastic processes, then under a set of some technical, so this is the unfriendly version of the assumption, and this is a slightly more friendly version of the assumption. So what it simply means, if these delays are proper random variables, and then actions take effect in the same order they are executed, and some of these more reasonable assumptions we can, we can easily argue away, the presence of the delays in the system does not affect the convergence to a pure strategy in Nash equilibrium of our algorithm. So it's in some sense an algorithm that's robust with respect to the delays in the system. And finally, coming back to the part that I skipped over, so I assume that at the beginning that every agent can reliably determine the set of a strictly better replies. But in practice, that may not be the case because they make mistakes and they may not be able to tell whether this particular action was a better reply or not. However, in some cases, they may be able to actually make better determination over time because they can observe the structure of the game through the payoff by trying different actions. So if you assume that these agents can better de determine these sets of uh, strictly better replies over time, then, uh, using this assumption here, so let me briefly go over. So let me introduce function pi, which determines the probability that agent i will incorrectly determine if action ai belongs to the set of a strictly better replies or not. So suppose this probability of making a mistake goes to zero over time in a particular fashion. And that assumption that I need for the decay is the following. So every player, make some mistake with some positive probability, but we can find some sequence that's decreasing sequence with a positive value, such that one, the sequence eventually converts to zero, and if you look at the probability that agent I makes a mistake with each agent, it decays roughly like this sequence epsilon t. 
So I'm allowing for the possibility that this constant is different for different agents, but roughly speaking, they are decaying in the same sim or similar fashion. So if that is the case, then you can show again, assuming that the sum of epsilon t raised to some constant kappa diverges, where kappa depends on the, again, the game structure, then you can show under some very mild technical condition that if you look at the probability that action profile belongs to the set of a pure strategies, that probability converts to one as t goes to infinity. So what that means is if you look at a very large value of t with a very pro high probability, you are going to be at a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Now, of course, this is a weaker result than almost sure convergence. And also if the epsilon t does not go to zero, but it goes to value something that's very close to zero, then again, at a very large value of t, the probability that they're going to be a pure strategy in equilibrium will be close to one. And the second algorithm, so in the first algorithm, what I wanted to do is simply design an algorithm that's robust with respect to the delays using very simple rules. So there, if you remember, the agent will change the action only if he sees something that's better. And if he doesn't see anything better, then he'll simply continue to play the same action. So that's something someone like me would do, being very myopic and uh, uh, risk averse. However, in some cases, that may not be quite enough. So the scenario we are interested in following. Now, suppose there is a, some perturbation in the system. So you may not be able to stay at the Nash equilibrium for various reasons. So one way, reason you may actually have a perturbation is because the payoff that we assume was deterministic is not in general deterministic in real life. Because as I said, game is an approximation to reality and we leave out a lot of details. And because of these details that we did a model, the payoff is usually random or noisy. That's one reason you may have a perturbation. And also in the second case, the agents may not be perfect. They may be faulty. If you are running algorithm time to time, you may actually select the wrong action by mistake. So that's what I mean by faulty or unexpected behavior. So these things may actually introduce perturbation to the system. In the presence of perturbation, getting to Nash equilibrium may not be sufficient because you may be quickly knocked out of the equilibrium. Then you have to, again, spend a long time searching for the equilibrium point of the system. So that's not necessarily good for us because you want to get to an equilibrium and stay there as long as we like to, we need to. So the question is, how do we select more resilient equilibrium that are robust against this kind of perturbations in the system? So in particular, what we want to do is to design an algorithm that will, one, uh, select equilibrium with a certain level of robustness or resilience, or if such equilibrium doesn't exist, then we'll simply select the most resilient equilibrium. So in order to describe the model, I need to go through a few things. So in this exam, uh, algorithm, each agent at a given time t, it's at one of the t plus two states. It could be a converged state or explore state or one of a t, what we call alert state. So when an agent is an alert state, it simply means it's still getting the highest payoff that it can. However, things are not quite what it was expecting before. So that's what I mean by alert state. So let me denote the state of agent i at time t by si of t. And then the, the way they select the actions will depend on the states. So the algorithm called the simple experiment, experimentation with the monitoring. So if agent is at explore state, then it's going to choose each action with a positive probability. So there is this positive delta such that the probability each action will be chosen is lower bounded by this delta. But if the agent is either at converged state or alert state, it's going to continue to play the same action it played before. Right? Then uh, in order to model this perturbation, I'm going to assume that at every time t, each agent makes some mistakes and chooses a random action with a probably epsilon. Right? So it makes a mistake, so it simply selects the wrong action. And I'm going to assume that when a mistake is made, every action is chosen with a positive probability, no matter how small that positive probability is. Now, uh, since the actions, uh, the, the selected actions depend on the states of the agents, let me briefly go over the state transition. If the agent is at converged state, and if the set of uh, strictly better replies is not empty, in other words, there is a strictly better reply that would get the agent higher payoff, then it immediately moves to explore state to explore other actions. Now, if 
The strictly better reply set is empty, but the payoff it's getting is different from what it was expecting, then it will go to the first alert state. Otherwise, it will stay at the converged state. Similarly, at explore state, if it sees a non-empty set of a strictly better replies, it stays at explore state. Otherwise, if the, the set of a strictly better replies is empty, with the positive probability, it will go to converge state, with the pro positive probability 1 minus p, it's going to stay at the explore state. If it's at one of the alert states, it behaves in a very similar way that it would at the converged state, except that if it sees no strictly better replies, but the payoff is different from what it's expecting, it'll simply go down the chain of alert states, go from one alert state to the next. So that transition is just summarized by this diagram. So to kind of define the, re the resilience or the robustness, let me define a few things. So first we have this mapping that tells us the distance between two action profiles, which is equal to the number of players playing different actions. And the second one simply says that given an action profile, I define this local neighborhood, which consists of the action profiles whose distance from A is upper bounded by tau. Right? And then using this neighbor set and then distance measure, I can define the resilience of Nash equilibrium to be the maximum number of a deviating players that pure strategy Nash equilibrium can accommodate without unraveling. In other words, up to if the number of players that deviate from the equilibrium strategy is less than or equal to this, less than or equal to this resilience, then nobody has an incentive to deviate. They will come back to that equilibrium point eventually. And I denote the largest resilience among all pure strategy Nash equilibrium by R star max. Right? And the standard assumption that people impose is the, what's called the interdependent assumption, which is simply says, given any action profile and subset of a, uh, agents, J, you can always find some agent I, which is not in J, such that if the agents in set J change their action to some other action, then agent I will see a different payoff. So that captures the interdependence in the payoff. Then what you can show is, under that interdependent assumption, there are two cases. If the maximum resilience among all pure strategy and equilibrium is less than the number of alert states, then the stochastically stable states are the pure strategy and equilibrium, whose resilience is equal to the maximum resilience. So it's only the most resilient equilibrium will be selected most of the time. But if the maximum resilience is greater than or equal to the number of alloysters, then all the Nash equilibria whose resilience is at least T will be stochastically stable. So what it really means is you can use the number of alert states that you plug in into the algorithm to choose the desired level of resilience of the Nash equilibrium that you are going to select. So by increasing T, you allow only more resilient equilibrium to be selected by the agents over a long period. Right? Yes? On the previous page, the assumption says there exists, but you said out loud you can find. Right, so that exists, that means assuming that I know the game structure, I can actually find it. Right. So I'm playing the, the role of the uh, super being. Oh. So these are the things that you can do with a game theory. So you can design certain algorithms with a certain properties. So that brings me to the uh, directions that we are pursuing. So one thing that we haven't been able to do is actually find a global objective function for generalized weekly acyclic game. So if you remember from the discussion of weekly acyclic, weekly acyclic game, there is something called the global objective function that's always locally aligned with the sum agent's payoff function at any non-pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And the second one is we want to actually model the random payoffs explicitly and then examine the effects on the algorithm design as well as the resilience. Which, and the last one is, again, kind of tying to the first part, which I didn't talk about, uh, joint utility design and algorithm design for efficiency and re resilience, not necessarily at the same time. So with that, let me uh, conclude with an acknowledgement to uh, the agencies paying my bills. <laughs> so let me finish. for
few questions. Yes? So thanks for the great talk. Oh, okay. So I was wondering, you know, how the, the how this compares to, let's say, you know, evolutionary dynamics. Right. You know, some replicates or dynamics. Right. That also converge to Nash equilibrium, you know, in exponential right. time. Sometimes. Right. Uh, how, how, how is it different? So it's quite different. First of all, the if you use evolutionary uh, game theory, first of all, um, any evolutionary stable games will be um, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Um, and but the convergence also becomes a different issue. So you, in fact, you even use a different, completely different model to show the convergence. So I'm not sure exactly how I can actually draw the comparison between those two. To be honest. Yeah, for example, you know, I was wondering if, so you know the Shapley triangle, right. you know, the evolutionary just keeps right. moving up. Does this get around that and actually converge to the national? Uh, um. First of all, I, I think it's possible that they may converge to different sets of equilibria to begin with. And also, the evolutionary dynamics usually use a deterministic model, right? So in the presence of a perturbation, I'm not sure what you can say about it. So what, in fact, the evolutionary stable equilibrium is even resilient. So I, at this point, it's, it's, I must say I'm not sure what the relation will be between those two models. Yes, Prakash? The random field. Yes. Who picks the random pairs? I'm sorry? Who picks the random pairs? Oh, it's not that anyone is fixing it, but once they choose the actions, the actual payoff they see, for instance, if the investment come, so even the Fed and everybody chooses their action, the actual effect will depend on many things, but many of these things that we cannot model in the game, because there are just too many things to model. Right? So because of the, the, these, the factors that we don't explicitly model in the game, that leads to kind of a fluctuations in the payoff they observe. Okay, so no one's uh, Nobody, controlling the uh, That's a different game, um, which I prefer not to go into, because uh, it's like opening a Pandora's box. <laughs> yes? So, for your first algorithm, you had some probability PI. If so, that convergence in some exponential rate, then you have some theorem like proving that your AT will converge to equal natural equilibrium. Uh, Almost surely, yeah. yeah. So, so that pi is related to the beta i function on your algorithm in somehow. Uh, what was the beta? I'm sorry. Um, which the beta i was choosing like uh, beta. I. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's different. So the beta i is actually the function that determines the distribution over the action space. Uh, the pi is actually the probability with which the agent is going to make a mistake. So the agent chooses the reply based on beta i function? No, no, so the probability of making a mistake, it's not something that it really the agent chooses, it's just that because the agent is not reliable, it may make a mistake by observing noisy observations. Okay. So how, how do you calculate that probability? Um, I, it's not something I can compute. I'm assuming that it's a simple, if it satisfies certain properties, then we can make a certain claim. Any other questions? No more questions. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.